are all one. <laughs> Mark, should I meet everyone now? Or? Yes, please do. Okay. Mute and Mark, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to day four, part four of the Lip Balm International Surrealist Poetry Extravaganza. Um, as you know, we've, we've had all sorts of readings. Uh, we had Dean Young on the first day, uh, Dominique Heck uh, on the first day. We had Will Alexander um, and Penelope Rosemont um, on the second day. Uh, Andrew Duron has been joining us continuously and continues to offer his comment from now and then. Um, <clears throat> And on yesterday, we had Charles Alexander, uh, we had Paul Hoover, um, we had Stuart Ross, um, and we had uh, Dalia Fatale, the contortionist, uh, which was quite something. Um, so, um, and today, um, we, we have Andrew Duran has joined us again. We have Charles Bernstein, uh, Robert Archambault, Kerry Etta, Paul Hoover, Sam Truitt, Michael Ruby, Pierre Juris, Nicole Perafit, uh, Nikki Jarashilo, and Kieran O'Driscoll, and also George Calamaris. Um, and Maxine. Who, and Ma Maxine Chernoff, yeah. Um, and, and George was supposed to be with us on, on the first day, but somehow that got a bit confused. So he's here with us today. Um, I expect anyway, this is gonna be a, a wonderful reading. Um, and I'm gonna start off by introducing my co-host, um, Jonathan Penton, who started unlikelystories.org, uh, which is a journal of electronic literature and art in 1998. He's lent his editorial and management assistance to many literary and artistic ventures, such as Mad Hat, the New Orleans Poetry Festival, Rigorous, and Big Bridge. Uh, in 2005, he founded Unlikely Books, which publishes three to five books of poetry a year. He's organized literary performances and performed himself Across the United States, his poetry books are Last Chap from Virgin Press, Blood and Salsa and Painting Rust, Prosthetic Gods, Standards of Saturday, uh, and the free eChat book Backstories, which you can download from Argotist eBooks. Thank you, Mark. So as the regulars have heard me say many times, I'm not very prolific. So what I do most weeks is I read something that's been published in unlikelystories.org over the past week or two. And today I'd like to read something by Bob Heeman. Um, Bob's a regular here and is frequently in the open mic. He's supposed to be in the open mic today, but I don't see him in the list of names. So maybe he's going to miss this. And that's okay too. Go watch the video. Here are three informations by Bob Heeman. Information. She knew it was fun to make mommy chase her, but she didn't know enough words yet to make it real. The dog and the bird and the cat inhabited her world and spoke to her when she slept. The more familiar the trees became, the more they scared her. She put on her green dress when she was happy. Information. They wear ties even when they don't have to. It doesn't matter where they are. It doesn't matter what they are doing. Everyone else also wears a tie. It's 1956 and the world is still black and white. It's 1956 and they wear a hat wherever they go. The women they know all wear dresses and are full of assumptions that are no longer relevant. Information. Listen closely and you will hear the moans of the damned. Listen closely and you will hear animals singing the songs of the angels. Listen closely and you will hear the horizon approaching. Listen closely and you will hear your own body losing its last breath. Listen closely and then repeat everything that you have heard. Again, that's by Bob Heeman, who might or might not show up later. The chat looks like it's, they say he will, but you know, he missed it. That's okay. Um, now I'd love to introduce our other co-host, Cassandra Atherton. Cassandra is an award-winning writer, scholar of prose poetry, and professor of writing and literature in Melbourne, Australia. Her most recent books of prose poetry are Pre-Raphaelite, Leftovers, and Fugitive Letters. She is currently writing a book of prose poetry on the atomic bomb with funding from the Australia Council. She co-wrote Prose Poetry, An Introduction, and the Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry, and she is commissioning editor for Westerly Magazine. Cassandra, will you warm up the mic for us today? Yay! 
Yeah, absolutely. I've just got a short prose poem today called Percussion. I remember your heartbeat beneath my floorboards, your ghost keeping me awake, tapping my body like a hammer below the knee. I would close my eyes to the wheezing of wood and dust, our bodies colliding in a silent coming together of breath and skin. In lunar moments, I still wait for you. Sometimes your image catches between my eyelashes. Sometimes I sleep uninterrupted by the darkness. I'd join you under pine tonight, but I think you know that I'm all tapped out. I would like to introduce the intrepid Mark Vincennes. As I say, follow along karaoke style with his bio. I'm sure many of you know it by now and wait for the, the big reveal at the end. Mark Vincennes is an Anglo-Swiss American poet, a fiction writer, translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist, and a musician. And his music featured last uh, in the last show uh, with, with Dahlia, the wonderful contortionist. He's published 15 books of poetry, including more recently, Becoming the Sound of Bees, Leaning into the Infinite, The Syndicate of Water and Light with Station Hill Press, Here Comes the Night Dust with Salmon Poetry, and Einstein Fledermouse from Sir Vision Books, and Sir Vision have killed it in this, uh, in this festival so far. Vincenzo's newest collection, The Little Book of Earthly Delights, was just released from Spite and Dival. An album of music, ambience and verse, Left Hand Clapping, is forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincenzo is also a prolific translator. He's translated from German, Romanian and French. He's been he has published 10 books of translations, most recently Unexpected Development by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Mertz with White Pine. And it was a finalist for the 2016 Cliff Becker Book Prize in Translation. His translation of Mertz's selected poems in Audible Blue is forthcoming from White Pine Press in the fall. Vincennes is editor and publisher of the brilliant Mad Hat Press and publisher of the esteemed New American Writing. He's lived all over the world from Brazil to China to Iceland to India. He was born, you know it, in Matilda Hospital on the peak in Hong Kong, but he now lives on Firefly Farm in rural Western Massachusetts overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain and where there are more striped skunks, redback salamanders and eastern hognosed snakes than people. Thanks for the tongue twister, Mark. Would you read for us, please, this, well, this evening, this morning, wherever you are in the world? I'd love to. Um, and I'm going to read um, a little poem called Dissidence um, from a, a book that I just finished called The King of Prussia is Drunk on Stars. Uh, this is section, the section is called On the Other Side of the Fence. Dissidence. Unfurled, who knows where to? Shall we lead them away? Some things are better left unsaid, you said, imbibing a strange drink, green and with a maraschino. Would the fish flock to join him, you said. Don't flock to those Lazarus eyes and that which is concealed, small in the lattice of that oh-so-human skull. Your silence smothered much of my talk, syllable by syllable. It was like blood and part of the sacrificial ritual. Through the trough we went, O oh Lord. One shall not be led astray. Let every mouth stand open and empty. Let a word like this enter and swing free like a pendulum. I shall dig myself toward you, they say. We shall make untruths truths, they say. Let a dying moth fly to her flame, they say. Do you hear the digging, the dredging, the logging, the extinct languages? Picture one of these languages in all of its coarseness. Picture a whistle that can be a word, a word that can be a story. Thank you. Um, and now I'm delighted to commence with our proceedings. Um, and first we are reaching into Ireland um, to Kieran O'Driscoll, um, who lives in Limerick and is a member of Asoda. He has published nine books of poetry, including Gog and Magog, Moving On Still There, and Surreal Man. His work has been translated into many languages. Liverpool University Press published his childhood memoir, A Runner Among Falling Leaves. His novel, A Year's Midnight, was published by Pig Hog Press in 2012. His awards include the James Joyce Prize, and the Patrick Catherine Cavanaugh Fellowship in Poetry. His poem, Please Hold, 
featured in Ford's anthology poems of the decade, has become a set text for A-level English literature. His latest collection, Angel Hour, is forthcoming from Service and Books. Welcome, Kieran. Uh, thank you, Mark. Can everybody hear me? Absolutely. Good, good. Um, first poem I'm going to read is um, Angel Hour, and that's the title of my, as you've just said, um, the title of my forthcoming collection from Sir Vision Books. And I'm glad to see that the, my editor and publisher is here among us tonight. Uh, hi there, Anatoly. Um, delighted to be in your stable. Uh, Angel Hour. This morning, I thought of the angels I saw in a pre-dinner catnap some years ago in Istria and the tremendous crack of thunder that same day in a village where we lunched on our way back to the coast. I remember how they stood in rank with their backs to me on a road of golden clouds that climbed into the sky from our holiday bedroom. Luminous, light as whispers. I fancied they appeared at the equidistant point between lunch and dinner. And wonder was that the point of fasting in the old church? Visions possibility. The deeds of saints and martyrs. The heights of Alvernia. The desert and the voice that cried in the wilderness. The dry thunderclap started me from my soup. What I'd read about the war came to mind, though it never got to the bistro we sat outside on the Barco's single street. I had ordered a second glass of Pinot Grigio when bang, a mortar shell behind me blasted the afternoon. But everything was okay. The thunder merely a warning. Two glasses are enough. And then the angels showed in the stretch of abstinence before the night's renewal of appetite and glut. The next one is my um, pa pandemic poem, and it's called Rip, and um, R.I.P., as you know, is, is requiescat in pace, but in this case, it's a rip, a small rip in one of my trousers uh, that, that begins the poem. There's a rip in my green trousers just above the knee. A rent in the scheme of things on the edge of my patella. I don't know how it got there and can't be arsed to mend it or go searching for a seamstress because when I am asked to recite or be a mentor, viewers on Zoom can't see my body's lower segment, and within my five kilometers, other walkers keep their distance, too far to spot the tear, because it's the pandemic. And the TV took it on to report the daily numbers of the stricken and the slain, and told us wash our hands or we'd become statistics. But many didn't wash because it seemed too simple a cure-all for such pestilence. Some were disease deniers and some held raucous shindigs. And there were those, and there were those unfortunates who once only, before they brushed an eyelid's itch, forgot to swab their fingers, although it's the pandemic. 
And even when I go for groceries to the Aldi, not a soul remarks the snag on the edge of my patella. And it's not because they're blind to rips or rents in garments. It's because they've got the jitters and the one and only and the one and only detail they look at is my mask, which is now a part of me. It's become my lower face. So I'm not at all put out by the rip in my green trousers. I'm glad of any trousers because it's the pandemic. And this last one is Psyche. Slightly longer. What can I say about this? Nothing really, I'll just read it. Psyche. I was re sorry, <laughs> I have a slight problem with vision, which is becoming less slight as the years go by. Anyway. It was raining softly in the night. It was raining beautifully. I wanted to be at ease, enjoy the mist on my face. I also badly needed a leak. The Psyche was on her way. And Quintus texted me nonstop about the terms of a bailout. Wheeling the rubbish bin to the bottom of the cul-de-sac, I was plagued by lists of things to do and the names of overly humble saints. Is there a word for this, the days that flutter by in a gaggle of imperatives, the insistence of bodily functions? From grappling with the rosebush, my wrist is a night sky. And of course I prefer to lionize life than write implicitly of death or be the sibyl in a jar Something must give the heart a lift, like the cool droplets on my face, even a touch of sympathy to cry freedom with the peoples of North Africa, rather than agitate myself in a stour of drudgery. With Quintus in his fervor asking how sorry are my suburbs, how London is my field of vision for the futures, I have become more conscious of the minutes measured out. Only the daily assurance of my androgynous beauty in the mirror keeps me sane, still thinking how unlikely the inevitable is. The Psyche is on her way, having climbed into the saddle ages ago. It was the most momentous fact of human life that she had journeyed out at all. But sometimes nothing happens for centuries and then a century happens in a week. And that's the Psyche's style. To take her time about becoming the unconquerable self. Seven times counterclockwise we jogged round the Chanctonbury ring and the devil appeared to us in a designer tracksuit, offering a broth of a bailout, liquidity support, a prohibitive interest rate in exchange for our souls. Quintus said yes, and I said no, and I had to smile my best androgynous smile at him before he changed his mind and the devil disappeared in a plume of shag tobacco smoke. And the, word was and the word was made sex as the flesh fell away from me when I went on a paleo diet. And Quintus wrote me
after my skirmish with the roses. I'm sorry, this has, has kind of a feeling of deja vu about this. Um, is this going to keep on repeating um, this? Uh, no, I, think, I think we're good now. Jonathan's internet dropped out, so and he mm -hmm. was recording. So, um, if you want to start just a little bit earlier, it was going so well. Yeah, I, I just um, this, as I say, I just finished up. Um, and the word was made sex as the flesh fell away from me when I went on a paleo diet, and Quintus wrote me love poems, which only served to mask the full extent of the deficit. I was sick from eating berries in need of my stirabout, as if I had been waiting for the dawn of agriculture. But the indestructible one has climbed into the saddle. The psyche is surely on her way. Even if the world, even if the world implodes, she remains intact, entire, a rider over the ruins of every incongruous thing. For that's what I like to think when I think of North Africa and the constellations on my wrist after my skirmish with the roses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kieran. Uh, so sorry about that technical interruption, but that was unavoidable. Um, our host dropped out of the Wi-Fi, so that's, you know, it was, the system is like that. I'm, I'm yeah, just... it's okay. No problem, no problem. Um, next, we hear from Carrie Etta. Uh, who's an Ameri American expatriate who's lived in England for 20 years and is a reader in creative writing at Bath Spa University. Um, she's published four collections, most recently The Weather in Normal, which came out from Seren in the UK and a Station Hill in the US. A Poetry Book Society recommendation, and, and she also edited Infinite Difference, Other Poetries by UK Women Poets, which came out from Shearsman, Individual poems have appeared in Boston Review, The Guardian, The New Republic, The New Statesman, The Penguin Book of the Prose Poem, and The Times Literary Supplement, and many other journals and anthologies internationally. She also publishes essays, short fiction, and reviews. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you, Mark. It's really good to be here and to see all these lovely, familiar faces, as well as new ones. Um, I'm gonna start my timer. Um, so I'm mostly going to read for my third collection, Imagine Sons, because that was um, perhaps my most uh, surrealist self-indulgence. Um, all of those poems are about um, the Imagine Sons series, about a birth mother encountering her birth son once he's come of age. Um, and then I might get on to some poems from a new series if we've got a little time at the end. Some of you may not know Aquanet Hairspray. Um, it's an American thing. When I was a teenager in high school, um, it was the cheap aerosol hairspray that the guys with mohawks used um, to make their mohawk stand up because it was cheap and it was strong. So it did the business. Um, so that explains the reference in this poem. Imagine sons one, fairy tale. My son leans from the tower, his red pompadour Stiff with aquanet, resists the quick wind. When he sings, the notes hasten to the forest a mile south before they descend. I clamber onto my restless horse. She starts before I am secure. Almost too soon, we reach the wood. The notes are red. I pluck them like poppies. Imagine Sons Nine, Greek Salad. For a week, I travel on business. And on the fourth afternoon, I go to a restaurant to have yet another meal alone. I order a Greek salad and read a Dickens novel to escape my loneliness. When the salad arrives, I barely look. How will Jenny Wren respond to news of her, her drunken father's death? I push the fork into the lettuce and it yields slowly to the tines. 
the balance of balsamic vinegar and olive oil with the sweetness of the red lettuce is perfect. And I pause, relishing the flavor. I hear the smallest of shrieks. I think I must have anticipated Jenny, that I must have been that engrossed when I hear it again. I put my book down so its open pages press the plastic tablecloth and keep my place, and my fork dives again, spearing a cube of feta. Stop! Stop! The sound rises from the salad. Who? What are you? I whisper. Where are you? A black olive wiggles atop a romaine leaf as though to wave. I am your son, brutally transformed. I glance around the restaurant and see the other diners, all in groups, engaged in conversation. When I last saw you, you were an infant. How did you get into this state? I think I see him cringe. Meekly, he says, I fell in love with the virgin mistress of the God's own olive grove. When I made love to her, I was turned into a tree. When you made love to her? The softest of whispers. They say when I raped her. So you are a tree as well as this olive, I ask, trying to move my mouth as little as possible as I see the waiter coming from the kitchen. So she tends to you there in the grove. She only knows I disappeared, Olive whines. She tends to me, yes, but without thought, without love, it is a fate worse than... Delicious, I say to the waiter swallowing the small olive hole. Just delicious. That's evidence of too much Latin at university. Does things to your mind. <laughs> Imagine sons 12, the birth mother, the adoptive mother, and their surfer boy, Venice Beach, California. Never falling, he rides the wave. I've been here for years. Long ago, a tall woman in a cream-colored suit sat near me on the sand. I asked her to watch my towel and nectarines while I hurried to the bathroom. On my return, I saw juice on her chin. Weeks later, I confided, that's my son pointing as he glided full toward us on a six-foot wave. He's mine, she snapped. She pulled off my pointing arm as easily as if it were a mannequin's and cast it into the water before running into the ocean and swimming toward him. Knocking his surfboard aside, she slid under his feet and floated to the surface. Hair the dark red of a nectarine pit lips fixed in a victorious smirk. All the while, my arm drifts slowly, surely toward him and toward her. Imagine Sons 24, the Lone Star set State. The La Quinta Inn near the Capitol looks, at first glance, like a stucco escher, pink walkways and stairwells in endless concatenation. Approaching the counter, I find the attendant's supple skin and rising brows all the more youthful for their incongruity with the building. Or perhaps that immaturity, the nascent masculinity that has altered his voice but failed to give him stubble, provides the ballast, the element necessary for such elaborate infrastructure to cohere. 
I'm afraid there's no record of your reservation, he says, looking at a monitor. But I've got a sofa bed at home and a six-pack of Negro Modelo in the fridge. There's so much catching up to do. And that is my favorite beer, I reply lightly, gingerly, grappling the handle of my suitcase. He leads me out of the lobby, along a walkway, and up a flight of stairs, his step quickening. When he turns a corner, eluding my gaze, I call the name I gave him 19 years ago and try to revive the image of his ID badge. I hear his steps but cannot catch up, so I hurry after, calling along the corridors, through the stairwells, past ice machines, housekeeping, the swimming pool, with my suitcase always rolling behind me until at last I see the lobby and rush through the automatic doors to the desk. He looks up, bewildered and innocent. Welcome to La Quinta, ma'am. Can I help you? One more from this, and then I'll read one or two new poems. Thanks, Cassandra. I appreciate that. <laughs> Oh, and Americans, you can't tease me for my hokey American accent. It goes down really well over here. I want to put it on for this, um, a Southern accent for this poem. <laughs> Imagine Sons 28, The Pilot. Two hours into the Bristol Newark flight, the seatbelt symbol lights up with a loud ding. Turbulence. Moments after, a young man, barely of age, emerges from the cockpit in a navy suit and matching cap. Coming down the aisle, humming, he surveys the rows to either side with a proprietary air as he passes. Passengers whisper to one another and point, and a squeal rises when the plane jolts, but his placid expression doesn't acknowledge it. At my row, he halts and asks with a smile, how you doing, ma'am? I glance about, noting quizzical looks. I I'm fine. Uh, are you uh, the pilot? I hear the woman next to me swallow hard as I say it. His grin broadens. That will be worrying, wouldn't it? Your life in someone else's hands, someone not really grown up yet, you not able to do anything about it. You're not the pilot. You're too young to be the pilot. The plane shudders, and he turns, running back the way he came, becoming younger with each stride until he falls into the arms of a scowling woman, into the shape of an infant, swaddled in navy blue. I feel like I found my tribe, a surrealist extravaganza reading, you know? Um, I'm just going to read one more poem from a, seri a new series of poems I've begun this year on what sentences do, the crazy things that sentences get up to. Um, so I'll read this one and finish. Thank you so much for your attention. There's a sentence that behaves like a cartoon mouse, excitable, cunning, leading me gaily to a cliff's edge obscured by a false backdrop. What does it want from me? The sentence will outsmart me by leading where I hadn't intended to go and exposing my gullibility. Here I am at the off license among the many flavors of potato crisps, considering the merits of sweet chili or honey ham. When I had struck out for the open air, the black thorn and wild garlic blossoming, all of the white blossoms of April. You simply need some provisions for your walk, the sentence says, even as I see it turn to an unseen audience and wink. Thank you. Thank you, Karis. Thank you so much for joining us from, from Wales. Um, and next we, we hear from Michael Ruby, 
uh, Michael, who is the author of seven full-length poetry collections, At an Intersection, Window on the City, The Edge of the Underworld, Compulsive Words, American Songbook, The Mouth of the Bay, and The Star-Spangled Banner. His trilogy in prose and poetry, Memoirs, Dreams, and Inner Voices, uh, includes ebooks, The Fleeting Memories from Ugly Duckling, and Inner Voices Heard Before Sleep from Argotist. He's also the author of uh, the ebooks Close Your Eyes from Argotist and Titles and First Lines from Mudlark, and five doozy collective chapbooks. He co edited Bernadette Mayer's early books, Eating the Colors of a Lineup of Words, which came out with Station Hill in 2015, and uh, Bernadette and Lewis Walsh's co collaboration, Piece of Cake, which also came out from Station Hill in 2020. Uh, Michael lives in Brooklyn and works as an editor of US News and Politics articles at the Wall Street Journal. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Mark and Jonathan and Cassandra. It's great to be here with everyone. Nine years ago, Station Hill published my trilogy, Memories, Dreams, and Inner Voices, which chronicled the streams of memories, dreams, and voices that flow through our minds. In the years since then, I've put together a hypnagogic sequel, Close Your Eyes, Visions, in which I chronicled what I saw with my eyes closed. I'm going to read a few poems from the visions section. Visions, July 9th, 2007. An old car slows down and parks at a corner. A man gets out and enters a candy store with a large window with green wood trim and a Briar's ice cream sign. This might be a vision of a moment far in the past, a place I only went once or twice as a child on Tremont Avenue in East Orange, a few blocks east of the Veterans Hospital. August 4th, 2008. There's a man with a goatee, a few gray hairs among the stringy black hairs. A bicycle racer bearing down on me seems to have wings. All of them bearing down on me seem to have wings. Man-made wings, not angel wings or bird wings. Water bubbles on the right side of a pond. Sketchy beings, sketchy mountains, sketchy seaways. It's darker than usual. Electricity lights the sky and the sea at night. A man has dressed up as a giant flower, his face just a small point in the middle of a gigantic rose. How can his neck support so much weight? A gray horse's head against a blue night sky. The head evaporates. A cloud is lit by the moon and it obscures. A flame shoots out the top of a, of a volcano, out of someone's head, out of a cigarette lighter. The flame turns into a broad ray of light shining down. Two black phone lines cross below overhanging vines. An old car pulls into the place. A horseman rides into the place. A big black spider appears at night. When is it so dark we can't see a thing? A multicolored elk, a multicolored sheep, a glowing white mushroom enlarges and then shrinks. A bush in the middle of the forest has a milky glow, ghostly. They are beings trying to get back, coming to an event at the top of the sky. I can't make out what or who they are. They're puffs, tufts, like transitory clouds. A house comes into view for a moment and disappears. Clouds sail rapidly overhead in the darkness. It's all clouds now, but somewhere off to the left, far to the left, the world will begin again. A horse, all caparisoned, heads toward me in a blonde light. The carriage heads toward me 
at a processional speed. This huge egg of light weighs the hemlock branches down to the ground. This huge egg of light, not the egg of a dinosaur, but the egg of a hill weighs down this corner of the house. The fish's open mouth is fluorescent. The pig's head, the horse's head glow. The racers have green wings and a transparent bubble for a head. I could duck under their wings and avoid being run over. The small carved crash glows. The hippopotamus's lower jaw glows. The cow, at cat, and owl glow. Silver liquid runs down the rocks. The hidden side of the narrow yellow house hills in the distance beyond the steep roof. I have no idea where I am, and I don't know where I'm going. July 8th, 2010. The most beautiful blue, yellow, and red. A large blue fish and a smaller yellow fish which turns into a red fish. The blue fish disappears and there's only the red fish. August 20th, 2011. The world is brown, in danger of catching fire from below. There's a blue wisp perhaps a TV screen in the brown depths. A creature with a small blue head and big orange hair, all orange. A flower with a darker orange head in the middle. What do we want to see in this shockingly blue sky? What do we want to feel? There's a thin pink diagonal being in the darkness, all muscle, a fully extended rabbit. A brown profile sits in the wan sunlight, just the right amount of sunlight. Something blue in the night, a blue star, a blue three-dimensional star made out of netting so the air goes through it. An orange skeleton lives under an orange sky, under an orange and black sky, under a black and orange sky, under a black sky. July 29th, 2012. There's an overstuffed brown couch against a darker brown wall, a small yellow window high up on the right. See, that is a painting, a brown couch against a brown wall, a small yellow window. That is a painting, the beginning of a whole oeuvre of paintings. These agreements tire us, our agreements tire us. So they got him before they called him up. Those are inner voices. I'm not sure what I'm seeing right now in this pea soup atmosphere, but it makes me feel very sympathetic to someone who is there. A blonde woman getting off a bus with a long thick braid running down her back and large brown sunglasses. Why? They better not say them more inner voices. A bougainvillea bush conceals a doorway. It's my niece Abby's house in Los Angeles. July 10th, 2013. A yellow construction vehicle forced me to slow down on a country road 
I swung around it on the left and back into the lane. It was right after that, a blue sports car shot out from a little road on the right. Thanks, for everybody. Thanks for having me. Let's see, maybe Mark had to slip away. Um, I know next up we have Charles Bernstein. Well, we have a video by Charles. Charles Bernstein is an American poet, essayist, editor, and literary scholar. Bernstein is the Donald T. Regan Professor Emeritus, Department of English at the University of Pennsylvania. He is one of the most prominent members of the language or language poets, but you guys knew that already. In 2006, he was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and in 2019, he was awarded the Bollingen Prize from Yale University, the premier American prize for lifetime achievement, given on the occasion of the publication of um, Near Miss. Bernstein was David Gray Professor of Poetry and Poetics at SUNY Buffalo from 1990 to 2003, where he co-founded the Poetics Program. You knew that too. A volume of his selected poetry from the past 30 years, All the Whiskey in Heaven, was published in 2010 by FSG. The Salt Companion to Charles Bernstein was published in 2012 by Salt Publishing. And his most recent book is Topsy Turvy, um, University of Chicago Press 2021. We have a video about Charles here, and I believe he's in the room, so maybe afterwards he'll comment. Let me get this going. Ars impotence. Uh, let me set that up and uh, so I can read the poem in its proper light here for you. Um, well, I'm, I'm backward. I'm topsy turvy. I'm topsy turvy. Oh my God. Poetry is made not of ideas, but of words. Poetry is not made of ideas, but words. Poetry is made not of ideas, but of words. Of words, poetry is made, not ideas. Words is what poetry is made of, not ideas. Not of ideas. Poetry's made of words, is made of words, poetry, not ideas. Made not of ideas, but words, poetry. Charles, can you say something about the title? Yeah, you know, um, uh, I could, but... Uh, I um I don't really know what to say about it. I was thinking of that ours impotence. What 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 you but you you're the close reader. Uh, I was what, I was what do you if, think it could mean? I was wondering if you might be thinking I, with of you that. I in this together, depending on what that means. Whatever the common menace, our outcomes will never be the same. Deep below our difference is not interconnection, but incommensurability. Human is not so much shared as contested. Empathy and solidarity are crucial investments but acknowledging our uncommonness alongside our commonness grounds struggles to resist the hegemony of the universe. I'm sorry I can't be with you today for your graduation and for this induction celebration to Phi Beta Kappa of Eta at Ohio Wesleyan University. But I did write this poem for you. It's called 
before the promise. I drew a blank on a torn door, drew another then no more, got stung, peddled frowns, knew things was bust, no way out of town. Sometimes it done it its way, then again, harder to say. What's looking up decides to knock you down before the promise of tomorrow. Tomorrow came. Morning on this pole, midnight at the other. Slipping, slapping, sliding on a cockamamie roll. Yesterday's dreams dissolve into today's goodbyes. I set out on a camel's hump, came back with just the eyes. Before the promise of tomorrow came, tomorrow came. A farther distance that we go within each moment spent than ever sent by heaven or scaled by human ken. Before the promise of tomorrow, tomorrow came. We twist, we turn, undo ourselves in triple throws. My goodness, how the time has passed. Let's get our stuff and beat a path to what we never knew, nor will nor who, nor say, before the promise of tomorrow came, tomorrow came. Be always drunk, that's all. That's the only question. So not to feel the horrific heaviness of time weighing on your shoulders, crushing you to ground. You must be drunk ceaselessly. But on what? On wine, on poetry, or on virtue in your fashion, but drunken be. And if some time on palace steps, on the green grass by an abyss, in mournful solitude in your room, if some time you awake, drunkenness dimmed or done, ask of the wind, of the wave, of the star, of the bird, of the clock, of all that flees, of all that wails, of all that royals, of all that sings, of all that speaks, ask what hour it is. And the wind, the wave, the bird, and the clock will answer. It is the hour to get drunk, so not to be the slavish martyr of time. Be drunken. Be drunken without stopping on wine, on poetry, or on virtue in your fashion. Eyes Song after Rukert and Mahler Comes I to this world abandoned having wasted the time I was handed, till all that's left is the bandage. No matter unnoticed, time passes, slowly as dreams become lashes, still alone and caught in rhyme's ashes. Dead to this world's wrong dwells still I, in my song, in every thorn, at every morn. 
as dreams become lashes, still alone and caught in rhymes and ashes. Dead to this world's wrong dwells still I in my song, in every thorn, at every morn. Or comes I to this world abandoned, having wasted the time I was handed, till all that's left is the bandage. No matter unnoticed, time passes slowly as dreams become lashes, still alone and caught in rhymes ashes dead to this world's wrong dwells still i in my song in every thorn at every morn wow thank you charles that was amazing um are you around or you prefer to remain anonymous tonight? Let me let him unmute himself. I'm here. Hi. And, hi. Uh, it's uh, good to see you and good to, to uh, do that. And uh, yes, of course, Baudelaire, my translation of Baudelaire. And um, a lot of my videos are on the Penn Sound page for my videos. But and some are on our Penn Sound YouTube. In answer to the comment of um, uh, uh, that came up on the, the back, it's J Joshua Corey. Well, I said there are many more. So, but I, I, it's not that I didn't want to be here with you. Um, as I, but it, for me, I can do better what I wanted to do with those uh, recordings. So, oh, I understand. Uh, I understand. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Charles. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. And I'm looking forward to hearing the rest and loved what I heard so far. Pleasure to be here again with you all. Thank you. Um, and next, next up we hear from Andrew Geron, who has been with us for most of the, the series. Uh, Andrew is the author of The Absolute Letter, a collection of poems published by Flat Editions. Um, his previously, previous poetry collections include Trance Archive, New and Selected Poems from City Lights, The Removes, Fathom, and The Sound Mirror from Flood Editions as well. The Cry at Zero, a selection of his prose poems and critical essays was published by Counterpath in 2007. Uh, from the German, he's translated the literary essays of Marxist utopian philosopher Ernst Bloch uh, from Stanford University Press and The Perpetual Motion Machine by the proto-dada fantasist Paul Scherbart from Wakefield Press. As a musician, Andrew plays the theremin in various experimental and free jazz ensembles, including one called Ouroboros, which he plays with Clark Coolidge. Um, and Andrew teaches creative writing at San Francisco State University. Welcome, Andrew. Hi, thank you, Mark. Um, such a thrill to be here in this company. Um, yesterday, I was waving a copy of Philip Lamentia's collected poems at you. Uh, and uh, also yesterday, uh, Luke Beasley, who wow. was joining us, from Australia mentioned that he did his dissertation on Barbara Guest. So today I'm going to wave a copy of uh, Barbara Guest's collected poems at you. Um, Barbara Guest is also a poet who has a, a strong relationship to surrealism. Uh, her work is usually uh, contextualized with the New York poets. Uh, and we all know that surrealism was a reference point for the New York poets. Uh, toward the end of her life, uh, Barbara, who lived here in the Bay Area um, and who I got to know, uh, in fact, I first met Paul Hoover and Maxine Chernoff in Barbara Guest's living room. Um, uh, she, she began to re really strongly identify with surrealism toward the end of her life um, and called herself a surrealist. Uh, so the last poem in, in uh, Barbara Guest's collected poems is, um, she practically wrote it on her deathbed, is, is a, a poem called Hotel Comfort. So I'm going to read that for you before I read uh, a few of my own. Hotel Comfort, minutes each hour took ostrich leaps on the roof of the Hotel Comfort in Strasbourg. These surrealist moments cherished each roof a long time. 
In the thickened weather of surrealism, the cathedral is across the street. Wise lettuces exaggerate their claim near the windows of the hotel comfort. And you have sent your letter of explanation for the pleasure obtained in the wooden jar. Speech maker, you have sent notes of pleasure in the glass jars, tasting of weather and cinnamon. Uh, and that's uh, Barbara Guest who uh, passed away at, in 06 at the age of um, 86. Okay, I'm just gonna read um, a few from my own uh, books here. This one is from my latest book, um, The Absolute Letter. And it's a, it's a poem about um, a cube. Well, uh, it's called To the Third Power. The cube is very stable upon the table. The cube is the remnant of a perfect thought. The vertices of the cube both control and conceal its power source. The faces of the cube contain an innumerable swarm of points ready to rebel against the eight privileged points that stand at its vertices. The map at its center. The cube is a continuation of chaos by other means. Each face of the cube sees only its opposite as its mirror self, as if ashamed, the other faces slant away in perspective. The faces of the cube, the phases of the moon. The cube is a box of eyes. The cube is a six-legged insect trapped in abstraction. The cube is the trumpet of an angular angel. The point at the center of the cube incubates triangles. The cube as a closed system is always cooler than its surroundings. The cube is a garment dropped at the door of eternity. The sex of the cube is the number six. The cube so rigid in all its relations reeks of eros. The brace of the cube is the embrace of pyramids. The cube is a citadel standing at the end of history. The cube wants only to rest here. Nature does not want to make a cube. The cube is a necessary accident. The cube is the wreckage of risk. The cube is displayed before royalty as the last of its kind. The cube is commanded into being as formlessness laughs. The cube in order to be understood must be floated in midair. An old man walks into a cubical white room and notices his footprints reproduced on the ceiling above. He finds he cannot exit the room. As he paces, the pattern of his steps continues to be traced on the ceiling until it has been completely blackened. He stops and looks up into the pathless black. Hint, there is a mathematical solution to his plight. Okay, and now, um, I'll read three poems from uh, my collection, The Sound Mirror. And the first one is called, Breath, bring nothing to term. Ring wrong instead of song. Sense, not sense, but fatal interference. Arc of the maker, the marker, born in reverse, the borrower, the rower from the frozen zero. So cotillions of ice, shall clatter to unsure closure, rare air or error, cool to all call, all clash of clouds, wanting one without outside, while knowing the turn of torn, the deviance of all device. So reckoning is this night wreck of the sun, perception pointing to its stoppages, still object and agile shadow, fluent fall to flow to flower and lightning littered letter. Imagine engine, the state in flames and black thoughts of the character of a cataract roaring to assemble the mind's semblance to nothing. This one is called to each correspondent to speech. What weight do I await? 
I am afraid that room is empty, apart from meaning. Often a cat is trapped in all the intricacies of its senses. This paradise is a desert populated by pillars, half human, half mineral. Sun ever some where a term is wanting to be called to coordinates horizontal to reason and vertical to vertigo. I am the house that inhabits me. As a man is unsigned, more than mantle of his mind, there is no master. The wall as will stands still. Salve me, solve me, my chorus to each correspondent to speech. So no is yet yes, and my revealing, my revealing. And the last one out of this book, um, No Telling. Of white, the eternal weight, the weightless. Of black, the blank. Rung long, wrong writing. Tone blown row that rose to raise, to raise all saying. O oh, unbidden eye, I bind, abandoned by. One to more, always married. Nation, shadow, duende shall dwell under shell and sell and 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 O oh, blow below intending mind blind governance of the in given void meaning that from state to statement the referent is afraid so no and no alone is polar to all pole so there i strike nowhere the name of my rose prosaic my prostrate man, and that thought that respires, spires. Thread through throat, through threat, through throne. Here is my hero, and here my tale of his jeweled, jailed integer. All right, and for the last one that I'm going to read, I'd like to share my screen uh, so you can see the words on the page. The, um, the poem uses a lot of homophonic play. So, which would be lost if, if you couldn't see the words on the page. So, um, see that okay? Okay, uh, this one's called The Phrases of the Moon. Full, the blow to a gong, gone blind, with the sight of white silk, O oh, milk of my reason, sun reseen in my mad, mad mirror, gibbous, less, sorry, gibbous, sense less science, the wish apparition of a perfect fact, as thought the war of one upon one, half, half a mind, almost mine, whole fragment, I am a being from another word, crescent, bow bent back, to what release, my lone line, the join of all I am not, a minor truth betrays a major one, a lore for the liar. For it is written, liar with a Y. New, calling all coincidence, I will deem the dark my day. Yet, if I say, I am lying, I am lying to you now. O zero raised to zero, I am lying with you now. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Amazing work. Look forward to what, what's coming up, my gosh. Um, next up, we have George Calamaris, who is former poet laureate of Indiana from 2014 to 2016, and the author of 17 books of poetry, 10 of which are full length, including Kingdom of Throat Suck Luck, winner of the Alexa Press Poetry Prize, The Theory and Function of Mangoes, winner of the four-way books intro series, and That Moment of Wept from Servision Books in 2018. He's a prof professor at English at Purdue University, Fort Wayne, where he's taught since 1990. Welcome, George. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Absolutely. Good. I've never done a Zoom reading, so this is going to be quite, quite the experiment. I'm really honored to be here and it's great to see so many old friends and um, to meet new friends. So I wanted to begin uh, first by uh, thanking Anatoly for 
publishing this wonderful book, uh, That Moment of Wept. I want to read a couple of poems from it to begin with from uh, Sir Vision Press. These, these uh, first poems I'm going to read are from my ongoing um, um, project of poems called The Bone Sutras that I've been working on for 20 years, maybe a little longer. The air was always beautiful. Then I emerged briefly as a centipede. I had carried over the karma of math and needed to learn to count on myself for everything. That's not a joke. Forgive me if I believed I'd never lived past 100. Then I was human again. This time a childhood chess master from Peru. I remember grieving the copper miners whose veins corroded like neglected knob and tube, who coughed as if they were in love with death. This was a long time ago. There were decades of black and red, knights flanking bishops, bishops gripping their groin, wanting to jump the queen. The air was always beautiful. I kept a bird in my chest, and periodically asked it to teach me how to swim. Now the carpet cleaners have come, bringing me a formula for dust mites. They seem baffled when I say, I would never kill another living thing. And um, here is um, the title poem from that moment of wept. What I know is a kind of brief reflex. What I know is an enactment of leopard blood, sunspots shot across the dark hour. I realize that the waves hold my broken, that the other end of thunder is a sad disposition that the notebook spiral that connects each page reminds me of the introduction of salt into each of the three lower ribs. You confiscate my mouth, try to force my singing sideways so the pain won't slip. You say your heart is protected, that you enjoy having it live in a cage, that feeling anything is good, even if only the wrong side of a coin. When the Cossacks danced their brotherly, let me kiss you dance. One by one, they told us what we had most feared. This loneliness, that moment of wept. I am done with vodka slosh, done with tricking myself into a Russian Orthodox spire, with caring for a kind confessional cast as a coffee clutch or exhausted rain. I hunt the umbrella head of mushrooms and find the exclusionary oil that might take me to intimate foreign places inside where I suddenly become an adept conversationalist. And I want to read next a couple of poems from uh, the new book that Anatoly and Servision will be uh, bringing out. Um, you held of me and coaxed the starlings back through the silk heavy rains. And this is uh, an opening poem from that manuscript. They cannot contain their sorrow. Again, this is from the Bone Sutra series. So the mahogany scrape of a bleeding seed laid itself onto the floorboards. So they came and plucked the shaving brush bristles, evoking the entire broadening of the dead wild boar. All my internal organs rise up like Bolsheviks. They cannot contain their sorrow at having carried me so long, so far from what I hoped one day to become. Or is it joy we feel when we kiss goodbye, knowing the stars may or may not camp in our separate mouths? I have sent myself off on many expeditions and always find a shaded fort and clear well water when I arrive. The dead rooster was placed before me like still quivering rhubarb. I thanked the Huns who brought it but confided
that I could not slit the neck. They looked at me as if clothed in freckles. They said something about spotted bedragglement and paintbrush soup and reducing inflammation in the leopard's wow and took the neck in their large hand, revealing the scars of Eurasia. I'm in the mountains right now, so I'm actually reading from, I don't have a printer, <laughs> good printers, I'm reading uh, a couple of poems from um, a computer screen. So let me, here it is. So uh, this is about the coccyx and sacral centers, uh, chakras of the spine, the distance between the coccyx and the sacral. It was not in the script, a woman, a woman playing checkers alone on a tree stump, touching the board only when wind lifted the cottonwood leaves across the field. I measured her feet from afar and knew she must have been purchasing illegal pigeons. A bird begins to emerge whenever we reveal our multiple births. I do not confide in the uninitiated. Their ears as yet are clogged with gnats. Emerge. A bird emerges whenever we reveal the starling severed hand. One photographic granule of the Belgian Congo is enough to get me to clench every time I hear the words elephant tusk or copper my mouth from Katanga. Then there was that previous life when we traded beads, dividing them equally, even among the dogs. Still, Someone always felt cheated, as if the other's bedding contained somehow softer straw. The time between incarnations is a sad glance. The bones of the head vibrate and are silent. Hand me the harmonica around the hobo fire. Inscribe me my mouth. The distance between the coccyx and the sacral can be immense. The rain arrives as all rains do, fierce and full of mending. Breathe in, breathe out, release the desire even for the moon-fired owl flight. There is a quiet like the long ending to a parade. And uh, those are from the, the two Sir Vision books. And I'd like to close, those of you who know my work, you, you know I'm very interested also in um, uh, Greek surrealism, being of Greek ancestry myself. And this is a, po a poem for the great Greek surrealist, very little known, unfortunately, Hector Kaknavatos. Uh, he was born in 1920, some of you may, may know. He um, published his first book in 43. And then uh, followed 20 years of a, of a period of silence, particularly because of uh, political persecution. This is called, apparently, Hector Kaknavatos, with the first line by Kaknavatos. Apparently, it could not be otherwise. Apparently, the kerosene lamps had been set in your chest. Apparently, even your mathematics could not save you and the onslaught of the junta tore your tongue. You looked in the mirror and saw a land of blood and hooks. You were Chiron, the superlative centaur, the wounded healer. If the wind in your throat had not been blood, if the blood nets had not been lowered into the sea, if your chest had not been a crowded school of trapped fish, Apparently, though, it was. Apparently, it could not be otherwise. Apparently, when it tried to be, even your chest was only half. Half horse, half man, the third half, an unpunctuated phrase. Leave the commas aside, you pleaded. Allow the world its mouth. The last instant recanted including the pauses most needed. Otherwise, 
it could apparently not be, not apparently could it otherwise, not in Olippo and its mathematical madness. You turned to surrealism, you turned to myth, you were the son of Titan Cronus and the sea nymph Philorea. How could your body have been half horse? Your poems, Hector, had grown horse among the colonel's manly stance. You were smart to hide your mustache, to clean your ears with tobacco leaves, to clone your toes. You stood against the wind crowding your owl and the forest on fire in the kitchen sink. Apparently, it could not be otherwise. Apparently, your surrealism would have lodged in their throats declared you decoded of letters not to be trusted, declared you once and for maybe. You were named for a Trojan prince, greatest warrior of Troy. You were said to have killed 31,000 Greek warriors. You, Hector, could only be killed by Achilles himself. What rose in him centuries before from heel to heart? What caused you to be reborn half horse, half man, to be reborn in 1920 as Hector Cacnovatos, the poet? You have largely and not, mostly and more. You have mostly not been forgotten, even when you have. You have lit the kerosene lamps in the watery chests of fish, known the sea because a sea nymph gave you suck, you called her mother. You called her phrase without a pause. You knew the enchantment of lamps, the burning word, the wick, the match we carry inside. In our mouths is housed the beginning of all sound, the ear and vowel lodging of pain and the loud of the mouth. Oh, Hector, oh, Cacnovatos, O oh, Ector, spelled the ancient way as a tunneling within. You have been waiting for the poem to mouth you into sound. You have been waiting in our land of far too few and words below ground, the pound of the indignant sea, below ground, your casket and its sway. Apparently, it could not be otherwise. Apparently, it could not be. Apparently, it could and couldn't and maybe still can't. Like all things surrealist, the fortuitous meeting of Hector, Achilles, and an umbrella, the chance of horse and man on the dissecting table. Like you, Hector, Cognovatus, like your mathematics disguised in the tamp of a lamp, where your voice wisely hid those years from the kernels, so that you could be with us now and forever. Hector Cognovatus's word without end again. Thank you very much. That's what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you, George. Wonderful. Um, and next, we'll be hearing from Maxine Chernoff. Um, by the way, Maxine, I don't know if I told you, but I, I picked up this old book of yours. Do you know that? Do you know that book? Maxine, are you muted? There she is. Should be able to unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Do, do you remember that book? A Vegetable Emergency? I'm having trouble hearing you guys. I'm not sure what's wrong with the sound. Anyone else having trouble? No. We no, can hear you fine. We can hear you fine. Can you hear us? I can hear you, but you all sound like you're in a, in a cave. <laughs> you might need to increase your volume or something like that. I'm pl I have it up. I don't know. It's I don't know what's wrong. Um, mute. I don't know. Can you? Do I sound okay to you though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we, we you have. Can hear me okay. Okay. 
I can hear you guys. It's okay. It's just strange. So, so let, me, let me just quickly do your bio then. Um, Maxine Chernoff is a professor of creative writing at San Francisco State University and a 2013 NEA Fellow in Poetry. She's the author of six books of fiction and 16 books of poetry, including Camera from Subito, and more recently, Under the Music Collected Prose Poems from Mad Hat, which gathers over 40 years of Maxine's exploration of the prose poem. In fall of 2016, she was a visiting writer at the American Academy in Rome. Welcome, Maxine. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for this lovely event. So many wonderful voices. and Good to see people I know and to see new people. And um, thank you all for, for coming. And thank you, Mark and um, Cassandra and Ted and all for putting these wonderful events together this whole season. Um, I want to start just by um, calling out some names of people who have been important to me in the area of surrealism. All of them really people who practice in some way or another the prose poem over the years. Um, so Max Jacob, Blaise Sendrars, um, Henri Michaud, and then the next generation really. Um, those writers were all born in the late 1800s, um, born in the early 1900s, Julio Cortazar, Clarice Lispector, Leonor Carrington, um, all very important to me as I um, fumbled ahead in the, fumbled around and sometimes ahead in the prose poem genre. Um, so, um, and people I admire. Um, I was just thinking also this morning about um, Cole Porter as a surrealist. Um, you know, you're a Bendel Bonnet, you're a Shakespeare sonnet, you're cellophane. You know, that's, that's pretty good. So um, I don't think Cole Porter was a member of the surrealist movement, but He's someone I admire too, who plays magically with words and language. So I'm gonna read um, a couple old poems and then a couple new poems and then a couple old poems and that'll, that'll be it. So this is from a book from 2008 called The Turning that was published um, by Apogee Press here in, in the Bay Area. And it's called um, As Make the Angels Weep. Um, begins with the quote that says Boethius was a victim of what would now be called future shock. When the God image enters the man image, when champagne is poured and the boat embarks on its journey, when truth is buried in the graveyard of certainty, when the entrance is a grave and an exit from the womb, when pure reason opposes practical reason, when I do this replaces I do that, when two shepherds are met by the village physician, when the chanter's art replaces, when the chanter's art perishes and tea gets poured regularly, when rappers revolutionize use of the drum machine, when the lapis blames the stone, when spirit becomes a religion, when monochrome replaces landscape, when open and direct means closed and opaque, when immortal, immortality flees the world, when celebrity death replaces news of war, when we historicize our futures, when we survive our disappearances, when children are mistaken for ghosts, when science moves to its green tower, when captured means in fashion, when death falls in love with stillness, when murder chastises history. Okay, that's that one. And then one more from that book um, called Light and Clay begins with a quote from uh, actually from a psalm will the dust praise thee psalm 30 um colon nine it sound like donald trump quoting a psalm here um light and clay the page was a place before morality before gilgamesh before the second prophet of revealed law the page was a hybrid of value and valuelessness a hybrid of community and selfishness a foster child of devotion the page was experience in somatic terms, a falle a deux, a terminal location. Cowboys and princes offered their lives, the cult of the dead worshiped there too. Lacking in value, it saw only faces. The page was a room, a picnic, a heaven, the utopia of words in a region of want. The page was a bridegroom, a bride and a lover, the child of the union of religion and anarchy. I will reflect it, the page said on Sunday. I will absorb it, the page meant to add. Between death and rebirth, the page stood waiting. Words came to call, speechless at best. So those are from around 2008. Um, thank you.
And then more recently, um, I was writing poems right at the beginning of our epidemic um, when we were all um, newly newly uh, launched COVID um, sufferers here and shut-ins. Um, these were two poems I wrote during the early time, like a year ago, April, I think. Um, they're sonnets, and they're from a sequence of about 20 of them, so I'm just going to read two. Um, number nine and number 11, as if, as if you need to know. And um, I have a reference at the end of this one to Pride of the Yankees. So I'm, I'm talking about um, I'm talking about Lou Gehrig. If um, if people don't know baseball, and um, he wasn't a surrealist, but he was a very good pit, a very good player. Okay, um, Sonnet Nine. Examples thick with meaning of a boy who left Sweet William at her gate, and of a woman with gray braids who sewed cat masks for her many friends. Uninvited lens descending on our spring, old solstice in a new world of refrigerator trucks and, sp and spreadsheets tracking viral load, while lotuses bloom and swans make stillness seek its center. We do not know how we'll discourage the jasmine until a proper window, or Marvin Gaye from playing Ain't No Mountain on satellites circling over tallies of the dead. My friend watches Pride of the Yankees, Iron Horse taken in the middle of his day, life limping towards spectacle, grand eloquent, or stumbling out of reach. Be brave for the newsreel, be grace. And another one from that time, thank you. Another one from that time, number 11. The older woes were beads of plastic ocean cramped with string and oil tankers circling in the soup. We pastiched our needs, brought, bought flotsam at the Jetson store to make a proper flag for life before our current limit. How nothing we predicted came to be and everything we never guessed has come to pass. How friends were spared and not in the ellipsis of a season, signs scorching air on radiant April days. On Hearts Island, ghostly work attends the barges of white shrouds where proper lives get captioned by their fates. To look at all the dying and yet not find the proper words attendant to the grief, how in the future they will sing the loss in ballads to their children of a world just opened as another died outside of myth and theory, magnolia blanketed in dew, moss thickened gate of a mute and humbling spring. And a couple, thank you. And a couple, um, a couple from under, um, under the music, the book that Mark published, um, these originally appeared in um, a book published by Counterpath Press um, called Here. And they're, they're prose poems that are very, um, that are very long lined on the page. They, they go from um, margin to margin um, in a book that's, I think, eight by eight, eight by eight or nine by nine, this book is. So they're square pages with long lined prose poems. This is called Beheld. And it starts with a quote from Theseus from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Gives to airy nothing, a local habitation and a name. Let us be imagined by the sympathetic eye, borders realigning, singularity lost as bees in cumulus clouds over a locus of belief. To stare at the world, thinking it fragile despite root systems deep and undismissible. To be dust under a stairwell, or a book left open as one sleeps, to comfort the view and conjure grace, blessing a glass of water or a hand that finds a small sheer ledge that yields to remembering. And um, someone below said, do prose poems have lines? Um, my idea wasn't necessarily that they'd have lines, but that they'd be, long, they'd be long on the page, they'd be wide on the page rather than long on the page. So, um, a, a thought about their horizontal nature rather than their vertical nature um, is what I had in mind. Okay. Next poem is called Window. The actual knocks on any closed door, beggar's robe tattered, features obscured in the dark. Light clarifies an edge of knowing, secret theme left as a match near a candle. Nothing that touches another close object can keep itself whole. Dust meets shadow inscribing an arc. Dominions are small crevices or crease in a story, parenthesis of an hour. The amaryllis grows in a day, 
its solstice private and ancient, flowering into the told. Okay, and, and two more little ones from this series, and that'll, that'll be the reading. Um, this is called Momentum. It starts with a quote, anyone accumulates a downfall. No stranger to call or response, you wander in velocity style through syllables of grace. You are accustomed to fact as a lie, lie as truth, encumbered beyond a sight of landing. Under your costume, you are a woman whose hair was cut short last year and remained that way. You are her voice under her own, her taste of certain minerals, harsh to the ear of promise, promise to waste warmth on geography, volatile intention to burn the woods, its features and maps, mistakes knowing face set boundaries for your own. You come in love, you leave in resemblance. And the last one I'm going to read is called Again. Um, some of these poems were actually based on weird images I saw um, of odd ecological moments in our current long tragedy of the world. Um, some of abandoned buildings that had been overtaken by um, the growth of nature around them. Um, some actually right in Detroit um, where um, homes had been abandoned and trees were growing out of the, the former roofs of those houses. I just found them very, very striking. And a lot of these poems kind of relate to that. Um, although I may be the only person who knows that until I told you that. Okay, again, it, it's interesting how what obsesses us um, never really sometimes even gets articulated in the piece that responds to what obsesses us. Okay, again. You ride up trestles to dreams remembered peak, where you exchange words for sentence, meanings on holy cargo of wished endings and lofty songs, toward the known birds of late afternoon, toward the uncertain plane of reason beyond the turn in your thoughts of brokenness or hope. There you are with your silence and your breath. In a room in the house of language, you drop intentions offered theory and claim a minute's circumstance, alone at a table where an apple is round and pear is fulfillment. Okay, thank you all. And thank you for the lovely afternoon. Thank you, Maxine. Thank you so much. And next we hear from uh, Pierre Joris and Nicole Perafit, who live in Brooklyn, uh, Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and collaborate on many multimedia actions and performances in the US and in Europe. Their Domo Poetics, uh, Caustic Actions, present performances, conferences, and installations that link their works, um, a first version of which was shown in 2017, a second version in summer 2021 at the Siwanichi Gallery in Luxembourg. Their collaborations started shortly after they met in 1990 with Nicole designing covers and illustrations for Book by Pierre, which today number over 20. Further collaborative work includes the teaching of seminars on Domo Poetics at Naropa University and translations of their own writings as well as poetry from the Occitan into English, Bernard Marcier, and from English into French. Um, Nicole has authored a number of videos among these, Anhalter Bahnhof and You Life, based on poems by Paul Salan, translated by Pierre, as well as six flash interviews with Pierre. In 2017, the pair collaborated on the poetry collection, The Book of You, uh, Le Livre des Comorans, edition Simonici. And in 2020, they created the video event, Robert Kelly, a celebration for his 85th birthday for the St. Mark's Poetry Project. During recent COVID confinement, they broadcast while at lunchtime on Instagram and Facebook. This daily show shared their lunch preparations. And by the way, they're pretty damn good cooks as a process of showing of their demo poetic practices. Welcome, Pierre and, and Nicole. Welcome, if we are visible. You are, you are visible on screen, yes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> As an introduction to the video, um, let me, let us fill you in a bit. From June 4th to July 15th, we presented Caustic Actions works at the Galerie Simoncini in downtown Luxembourg. It was real and yet felt totally surreal since we had been mostly confined for over a year. So the work 
comprised of paintings, video recorded performances, installations, framed by an opening and a closing live performance involving painting and poetry, and was displayed on three floors of the gallery. In the basement, the sanctuary, on the ground floor, the caustic refuge, and on the second floor, the canopy. These environments embody our karstic domopoetic processes. Domopoetics is the name we give to the daily practice of transformation of and in our works, be it writing, painting, video, physical conditioning, or our shared household and familial activities. Caustic refers to the geological phenomena of dissolution and transformation at work in the formation of superficial or underground limestone topographies. By a similar principle of infiltration, language transforms into poem, breath into song, and colored chalk become pastel into marks on paper or canvas. Caustic actions works are in quest of equilibrium through an ecological consciousness in the literal meaning of that term. Greek oikos, house, household, dwelling, and logos, discourse, and thus the science of dwelling. So today, for the Lit Bomb Surrealist series. So we are offering the video of um, uh, the video of the finissage. It's a video that we just finished editing. So it's, it's still a bit rough, It's uh, but we wanted to offer it. And it's um, derived through the three floors of the exhibition. And shout out to our gallerist who was online, uh, Andre Simoncini and uh, Ingrid Anders, and uh, voila, so I'm going to try to send the video. Directly, but let me say one more thing there. Today, maybe more than ever, we think the real is surreal by itself. If looked at, played on, touched, stood in on headstand, or caressed with awe by our four eyes and two voices. Try to send it, Nico. It Hello. 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 They're not going to be back.
Thank you, Nicole. Yeah, that was that was incredible. Um, it was you could say almost it was a life experience. Um, <laughs> and um, we're delighted that you're with us. Is there anything you'd like to add at the, the stage? No, I want to say thank you for having us. And um, uh, the one thing is, few of these videos, the full full of the, the full version of them were featured in the previous. Um, uh, lip balm. Lip balm there was a lip balm yeah. thing where we did some of the early. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I want to send Nicole because it is really she who does the heavy lifting on uh, the editing of that. I'm basically the word guy. She does all this other stuff from painting <laughs> to editing the film and so on. And she can sing even. I can't. So I just play along. But it is a lot of fun doing it, and we had great fun, didn't we? We sure did. <laughs> I think it shows, but uh, it's... it's really... I, I, think, I think the Crown and Luxembourg were intrigued, at least. Yeah, they were. I love the fact of having those people outside going by, you know, it was the same. And we loved doing it exactly in that ground floor, because it is both the political material that you saw, and it is also the windows that give onto, the main, onto main Street, really. And yeah. people coming by and can look in and come in or just look in and wonder or run away. Uh, it's up to them, but we are offering. The, the pianist was, uh, the keyboardist was uh, Colin Toniello, who was a, was a total improvisation as a young pianist. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you, guys. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank you for the wonderful re readings. Before. Um, next, next we have Robert Archambault, um, who is a poet, a literary critic, and whose works include the Citation Suite, Home and Variations, Laureates and Heretics, The Poet Resigns, Poetry is in a Difficult World, The Kafka Sutra from Mad Hat Press, and Inventions of a Barbarous Age, Poetry from Conceptualism to Rhyme, also from Mad Hat Press. Uh, Bob, will you be joined by Nikki tonight? You there, Bob? Bob, are you muted? You're on mute. I am, and it's not the only technical error that I will afflict you with tonight. Uh, I'm sure of it. Uh, no, uh, Nikki will be joining us, Nikki Jovisillo, only uh, sort of virtually. I, I don't have any poems for you tonight because I'm running sort of a terrible uh, poem deficit with the world. I'm importing and reading a lot of them and writing very few. Uh, but I've got a video for you, short one, six minutes which is an adaptation of material from what I can now call my forthcoming novel. Uh, we just signed a contract with Regal uh, two days ago called Alice B. Toklas is Missing. And uh, one of the premises of the novel is that, uh, which is set in the 1920s, is that the futurists, you know, Marinetti and company, actually meant quite literally what they said in their manifestos. Uh, I don't know, is Charles still here? Charles once gave a reading from the Futurist Manifesto in, I believe it was the Museum of Modern Art, which I thought was a supreme act of irony because uh, the manifesto calls for the destruction of all museums and libraries and archives and cathedrals and all the statues of Paris and Venice because in, in the estimation of this group, uh, the past was in some sense a repressive force. And in my novel, uh, Alice B. Toklas is kidnapped as part of a somewhat absurd plot for the futurists to actually destroy uh, the Louvre. And at a certain point, the surrealists have to, have to take sides. And I've adapted one of these debates they used to run on a regular basis. Uh, they're going to put the past on trial. And uh, that's what you're going to see in this uh, with um, a slightly fearsome actual historical <laughs> figure <laughs> named Toyen, uh, a, a you know, radicalized yeah. surrealist uh, played by Nikki Javasillo. Uh, who some of you might remember, uh, and Mark, I know you remember from the cover of the Kafka Sutra from Mad Hat Press, which makes a great gift for all occasions, right? Uh, as will Alice B. Toklas is missing, coming soon from Regal. Uh, all right, well, without further ado, uh, I'll get the film up. There's a 40% chance that as I attempt to screen share, I will in some way break the internet. So be prepared for that. Also, um, for reasons that will become apparent, uh, the little film is called The Bones of St. Chilean, 
And I just feel like I have to offer an apology to Father Joseph Donahue, uh, who is watching, uh, because I went to Notre Dame. All right, uh, let's just see if we can figure out how to screen share this. I believe if I press this button over here, and uh, then these buttons here and here, and this button, and then this button, something will happen. And I think this just might work. Comrades, I am called Toyin. It is short for Citoyen, citizen. I will make the case for the prosecution. But where, may I ask, is the defendant? Habeas corpus, as the American lawyers say. We must have the body of the defendant present. Well, where is it? Everywhere and nowhere at all. But for our purposes, here, let this reliquary stand in for today's defendants, the past itself. J'accuse. I accuse the past of stifling the imagination. It is a gaudy box in which to imprison us with the dead arms of habit with trembling submission, with, with hierarchy. I accuse the past of senility. It is a cracked wall built to stand in the path of all creative efforts. It must fall. Leonardo da Vinci spoke of cracked walls. Stare at a decrepit walls, decaying plaster, said Leonardo to his students. Stare long and with an empty mind, and you will see those cracks form scenes and landscapes more wonderful than anything in this fallen world. Draw what you see, and you will draw a world more marvelous than that which we are pleased to call real. So let the past be that cracked wall. Comrades, maybe the wall isn't the only thing that's cracked. Comrade Gabriel, I put it to you. What do these things have in common? Item the first, an Egyptian amulet, onyx, and unnaturally cold to the touch. Item the second, a whalebone carved by a sailor's steady hand a century ago on the sun-hot deck of an American whaler. Item the third, a box of mummified cicadas from Vietnam. Item the fourth, a Tatanua mask, one of the rarest in New Guinea. And the final item I shall mention, though I could go on, an ancient Mayan doll, once the adored possession of a child raised beneath the temples of Chichen Itza. Well, don't act like you don't know. Breton? They're on the shelves at Andre Breton's apartment. I've seen them there. He buys them at the flea market in saint Helene, Paris's most democratic repository of the past. It's the people's treasure house. You have seen them, yes. I have seen them too. So many come to stare at them, it may as well be a museum where the past grimaces at us as if from a tomb. But we should ask, why are the flea markets of Paris filled with masks that opened the paths to the ancestors in New Guinea? Why are the husks of insects of Africa and Asia pinned to a French wall? Why has a Mayan girl's doll fetched up on the Rue Fontaine? The past is imperialist. The past is blood and plunder. You call Breton the Pope of Surrealism. Don't get me started on popes. The past is a man's hand over a gasping woman's mouth. A nightmare. This very trial is a nightmare. 
then you grant it the greatest authority, the authority of dreams. You stole your ideas from Breton's manifesto. He stole his manifesto from my subconscious. Let's look at the defendant comrades. This box, this box contains the better part of the shin bone of St. Chilean the itinerant. Comrades, the bone has for some 1200 years preserved the memory of the venerable Irishman who converted Prince Gosbert of Wurzburg. And how did he sway the little princeling? Hmm? By allowing the devil to steal his enemy's horses and ride them into hell. Know well that water taken from the saint's tomb and used to moisten the navel will restore virginity. Turnips planted on St. Chilean's Day will grow to unusual size. Moreover, comrades, if these turnips are ground into a paste and smeared on the abdomen, they'll protect against all seductions by witches, except from those with the third nipple, obviously. And if one sees a glowing fern on St. Chilean's night and eats of it, one will walk invisible among one's kinsmen. The bone in this reliquary cured one prince of syphilis and another of congenital stupidity. This little box, this little box is the past, yes. And the past is surreal. We cannot condemn our own. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Amazing. Do you have anything more to add? Um, just this hat, I suppose, you know. Uh, it was an excuse to buy this hat and never get to wear it again. Thanks so much for indulging me in this. Thank you. And say hi to Mr. Magritte when you go to sleep tonight. Um, so we have Sam Truitt, who was born in, in D.C., in Washington, D.C., and raised there and in Tokyo, Japan. He's the author of 10 works in the Vertical Elegies series, among others in print and other media, including most recently Tokyo Atoto and the forthcoming State Shaft, Shaft State. Uh, among other recognitions, he is the re recipient of numerous Fund for Poetry Awards, a Contemporary Fellow uh, Award from the University of Georgia and a Howard Fellowship. He's the producer and co-host of the podcast Baffling Combustions, director of Station Hill Press, um, and he lives in Woodstock, New York. Uh, for more, visit his website, samtruitt.org, two Ts. Welcome, Sam. Yeah, such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Cassandra, Jonathan, and Mark for putting this together and, and a real pleasure to be in your company in this constellation, um, you know, that we form together at this moment. I thought I would read uh, from some past books and I thought I would read from the perspective of a sort of surrealist uh, throb. I thought I'd read from this book, Anamorphosis Eisenhower. Um, and I thought I'd read the first piece from this, which, um, you know, this constitutes more or less where I started and uh, the crack. Um, that the first line of this, this work presents, does it open it? Um, has a surrealist uh, timbre or verve. Uh, the first line is, but her favorite poems take place underwater. Um, and that sense of the underwater as a surreal thing to it and the, and the kind of, you know, as being a male of the species, the sort of uh, the female um, placement. And this is, uh, first one is called The Kerf. But her favorite poems take place underwater. This one is called Holding Your Nose at 40 Fathoms. It is Easter afternoon and we walk to McDonald's beneath the sky of graphite clouds. But her favorite poems take place underwater before blood had become the seventh element after money, an ancient poem when it was still bereaved that everything that happens is matted with meaning and where would my life be if I turned around? But her favorite poems take place underwater. 
this one was written while we were taking a shower, slippery with soap, washing the black bird, its throat, its beak, its heart slamming against four hours watching the set, drank one beer, smoked eight cigarettes, and where would my life be if I turned around and against her thighs splashed the mind and I found my body again under your hand and the circuits of my body entered the poem, its throat, its beak, its heart slamming against my body again under your hand and the angry men in their goggles pursue their mad career around the raceway of life, of life, of breath divided in and out, the loops of distraction as the scenery and the angry men in their goggles pursue the spectators at the edge of their lungs whipped in and out a view of the screaming cars and handsome Hansen in his marvelous eight, car grime streaking his lovely flushed face. The angry men in their goggles pursue with a red scarf streaming behind him. The violent flowers in our mouths and in the sky and what is fun but taboo speed and love we must beneath a black umbrella ghosting through the rain in his marvelous eight car grime streaking his lovely flushed face teeth clamped to a stogie smoking through the foam and the blocks of 20th century houses and bob is in the basement filming a subway chase in boston we've run out of oil Scythia blooms on the fences, and that's not all. But I meet Mark in an hour, and Bob is in the basement tearing out the curtains, picking up where we left off, clothes strewn on the subway floor. Everything sad is remembered somehow. We must blaze a trail through the banks of marigolds, and sometimes we must crawl on our bellies through the dirt, picking up the polka left off on central toward what was left of the palace, the embattlements, the ring garden, and the black bird perched in a window well at the last call saloon, winks to me like my old granddad in bathrobe and slippers, picking up where we left off, picking up where we left off, oh brother, from somewhere near the solar plexus, sh straightening his shoulders. For granted, in the big baffled smile of an old man slipping down through the graces, whipped in and out a view of the plow, an old man slipping down through the grease hole. Watch out, son, the tail fuselage is on fire. What is the nature of rhyme in the hive's gold cluster? The moon that rose between each of our days, the night we held beyond each embrace. What is the nature of rhyme in the hive's gold cluster beneath graphite clouds, madam? So that for me, <laughs> broke something open that, you know, I've been uh, following ever since. This is from another book called Vertical Elegies uh, 5 or 6, 5, The Section. And uh, this is a collection of sonnets, 69 sonnets the nature of which is a work of cut up to the extent that, you know, in New York in the 90s, you know, I was writing one way or another and, you know, aggregating a lot of material and then, you know, not always that like um, ebullient about the shape of it. And so what I did is I took it all and reconstituted it into this book which is a work of collaboration with a former self, you could say. But I'll read from the middle of it, which is uh, 35. What pains out there in the dark waiting to overtake us, I don't know. Between the snake and the mountain, the man drinking coffee, 
peeping up at the lighted window, planning our rapid development, music for ice cream trucks, for no train ride is smooth or sexless, or bring a pause to your question, concentrate on the sidewalk, gathering strength in front of it. Left is where my broken pinky is, on the ground, stone coming out of it, dew on my shoe tip, sentences, aggregates, aggressions or accretions into which a single impression can intrude inside and die inside obsidian dagger. But best if we remain naked ranging through the empty rooms of air like fate, the thought is enough that thrusting through the middle And then uh, I'll read from this recent book entitled Tokyo Atoto that chronicles a uh, sojourn I took before the lights went out, um, you know, just before the pandemic uh, at the end of, I guess, 2019. And the nature of this book is such that I reproduce on one face the original notebook from which this material um came and then this is the transcription you know on the opposing page you know happily they're more or less consonant because uh you know it came off the tongue in a fairly you know <laughs> uh you know fluid way so uh i'm going to read from the beginning and then i think i'm slated to read a little bit from the middle and you know we'll keep going there's an ad, almost square, framed in chrome, covered by plastic sheet, beat to hell in the open, on a corrugated wall of an open mouth, of teeth and upper gums, almost perfect. And you can see the darker pink tongue stilly cleft at its axis as it is open, lips, I sense lipstick or gloss, a bit of nose and nostril above the gate of the teeth. On the boulevard, a cop car, its cherries and berries flashing, I see through a light, a tight mesh grate on a platform, hook right down a residential street and all the cars passing, pausing or parked, tagged with dazzling patches of sunlight reflected off hoods and roofs. And I am in one, in my great window, fingers in the mesh, holding on, wondering why keep going, clawing by bus and train and plane, let alone hands toward Tokyo by way of Peking, hoping I cop the day pass to walk the periphery of T Square as though circa half a world away, some existential exegetical geometry by which to fit into a conspiracy of ads, which, what, when, what we really need are minuses, less, sticking straight up, though not a wall, as what spills through them, fingers, flesh, white flesh against steel mesh or out the mouth of the security snake put in place to strangle what i have just passed through shaken as even as i carry no contraband or record or exposure i swear i am at heart a criminal and so watch my step and follow the rule to not become a problem and help people as much as I am able to get through the wall, or maybe me too, keep taking away thought by thought, grooving to the terminal countdown, ethno acoustico atmospheros hum all below the Muzak, what colleagues, friends, and family form these knots, these hills, and 
hillocks that are probably mountains of sound shapes that seem to correspond to those through whom they speak what speaks them with the sun out the slated wall of glass behind me at the bar low in the sky across the tarmacs and the fins and tails of planes the air like the dirty martini the bartender is pouring and it's sad to report those of us alone are all in screened untalking scrolling or tapping swiping staring into cell phones in a borgesian leap to in some escape just like i'm on this page or rescue mission if there were anything to leave or retrieve our collective ennui <clears throat> And then, you know, uh, responding to um, Maxine Chernoff's thing about the desire to see trees folk poke through the roofs of houses, and also, you know, touching on Nicole and Pierre's uh, domo poetics, uh, you know, I've been working recently with material around Cuba and visiting Cuba, but also my uh, friend, the poet Omar Perez, uh, you know, in our relationship in the course of that then you know i wrote this so i'm going to read this and then hold your hats i'm stuck between jerusalem and athens the axle of the rig cracked waiting for a toe moping on the side of the road socrates and moses jumping up and down playing double dutch with our skirts raised and lead and gold ropes in rhythm between us sounding off all roads like belfast's ghosts a trench is not a parliament if the dead lose their 64 names intersecting pulse and converging mass object is only in its disappearing at all points one road before one even if one in circles even if it's against a wall moving with a tree thrust out a hole you can see through rebar the floor someone's dusted a part of off and under bro broken roof under a tarp made of camouflage material has formed a hexagram to sing being on the only way to freedom is the song of is the sound utopia and uh yeah and then after yesterday i wrote this and so i'll read this now back into the place that it came from we still wrangle over zero when what we feel is its halo as we assume the nature of things as art as structure as wild as thought a cliff at the edge of which we discover by what we discover by 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 thank you sam Fantastic. So I'm now going to pass it over to Cassandra and Jonathan for the open mic part of the evening. Uh, we have a few a few readers tonight. We've got four of our best. Jonathan, starting with our first two, and I will be finishing with our last. So stick around because they're awesome. All right, sounds great. Um, let's hear from our wonderful Dewitt Henry. Dewitt, are you around? He's a marathon runner. He's around. He he's, he stuck it out. Okay, you got it. <laughs> well, think of this as a low calorie mint after a long feast. Uh, it's a real connection is, I'm gonna ask you to remember Kafka's story in the Pina Colony. On meaning, what's the meaning of this? How dare you? We meant to, but forgot. 
meant well but failed. Another time, maybe. Dream deferred. A meaningful experience, you say. Meaning what? Opposite of empty, pointless, futile, waste of time, boring, nonsensical, indecipherable. We had the experience, but missed the meaning. Some fear wasting time, e.g. Thoreau. I didn't want it to live what was not life. Living is so dear. Others go well wadded with stupidity for fear of tragedy or siren songs. Not all meanings are positive, of course. Lessons in futility, mistakes, dead ends, reverse effects, traumas. I'm going to get drunk or never again. Suicide's not all it's stacked up to be or not to be. Consider Cleopatra's show, making hungry where most she satisfies. Consider natural wonders. You've got to go there, experience the experience, or you can't. Kant. The suburban skeptic David Brooks sits on a rock in the big Blackfoot River, waiting for one of those perfect moments when time stops. But nothing happens. Too late in the year, perhaps. Landscapes, vistas, powers breathe forth. My brother called the Rockies God's country. Are you important, necessary, useful, all you're meant to be? To whom? To anyone? Society? Yourself? Room for five in the lifeboat, women and children first. Who goes to combat? Who stays home? Essential personnel? Glad you have self-esteem, but you don't mean anything to me. What connections matter and what don't? Oh, that was just sex. Tennis without a net. Golf without a money bet. Poetry, utilitarians think. The torture machine's message, only gibberish still. <laughs> Do it, thank you. Um, yeah, wonderful as always. Good to hear from you again. Okay, uh, Cindy, are you in the house? I'm in my house. I have right. to be in my house. And Cassandra knows there are no bay windows in this house. That's a normal window in case you were wondering. It's not bay. <laughs> no bay. I'm in my living room. The one that John Wessick eloquently wrote about. And I'm very honored to be reading in front of this uh, star-studded group for this uh, surreal series, which I'm really sorry to see ending. Now, um, I'll add a surrealist poem to the mix. Um, and if it sucks, you'll be happy to know it's only four lines. It's called Stochastic Thoughts. And I didn't know what stochastic meant either. So if you don't, don't feel bad. I looked in the thesaurus for a synonym for random, and I came up with stochastic thoughts. I'm hungry. I'm full. I'm hungry. I'm full. I've misplaced the moon. Hey, look, I've got a Ferris wheel in my pocket. The end. Thank you. That was awesome. Scintillating Cindy in her living room. There's nothing better. Thanks, Cindy. We have Bob Heeman in his kitchen as a follow up. Like, of course, why wouldn't we go from Cindy's living room to Bob's kitchen? Although, Bob, have you got your video on today or are we gonna to have to imagine my the kitchen video floor? is having problems today for some reason oh, i'm oh. sitting here it isn't dark here but it, sh it sure looks dark if you look <laughs> my name looks is. dark on the square uh, that's and i have to apologize to those of you who i missed i had taken a nap i set the alarm i slept right through the alarm so anyway, my apologies. I'm sorry I missed you. I'll 
check out the, the recording of it. Okay, this is from my book, House of Grand Farewells. Hat. The hat keeps latent midgets from operating on your paranoia. Monkeys watch from a safe distance, hoping to avenge their chastisement. The opposite of the mud is always the minister. Their game founders in the epistemological jungle that implicates our furious beginning. The hat mutates into something gigantic that occupies the entire sky. From its angle, something frightening is born. Thank you. Fantastic. You are the king of uh, surrealist poems, especially prose poems. I've been loving getting into lots of, of Bob's prose poems lately. So check Thank him you. out. And to finish, we have crowd favorite John Wessick, who has eliminated his wombat for something a little <laughs> bit more fitting for today. <laughs> and he's going to finish up our open mic. John. Oh, back in you go. Great. Um, back in the 70s, some of you may remember the poster of Vera Fawcett that everybody had on their uh, dorm room wall. So I think this kind of fits the, the, the theme of today. It's called Poster on the Edge of Forever. The gas giant planet's orange glow illuminates marshmallow trees outside my window. Hydrogen-filled balloon sharks gather in the clouds and wait to ambush unsuspecting campers. Some may contain sulfites as a preservative. My Fera Fawcett poster's edges curl with age. After all these years, I still long to feel those huge white teeth sink into my delicate flesh. The smell of cigarette smoke reminds me of Dieter and the cement shack we shared in Ecuador's central highlands so far from the M33 galaxy. We moved there from a small Kansas farming community after mother died and Farah, much younger than, adorned the wall next to the window that looked out on banana trees dusted with methane ice and frozen carbon dioxide. An old rusted grocery cart lay on its side in the concrete gutter by the railroad tracks. On Tuesdays, the steam locomotive chugged into town, bringing basalt, iron ore, and vials of Ebola virus. Happily drunk on ammonia and organic compounds, Farah, Dieter, and I lived in the jungle, but when the train derailed, I arrived first on the scene, forced open the baggage car's door, and found thousands of headless Barbies. Vultures <laughs> fed on carrion and screeched, sounding like the crash of the Viking spacecraft. Trying to forget, we feasted on hellfire and damnation cookies, but it was no good. Dieter's red lipstick smudged the coffee cup rims, and the rainwater tasted of dust. He complained about Farah's eyeliner. Look at yourself in the mirror, he screamed. Mirror, she scoffed. I navigate by echolocation. What use do I have for mirrors? Love it. That what what better way to end? Um, but I'm going to throw back to Jonathan and to Mark. Jonathan, any comments? Um, nope. Um, um, I wanted to make sure everybody knows that next week on Saturday, six days from now, we will have a new and wonderful reading. That's August the 14th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we'll have the Women of Hanging Loose Press. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Excellent. And I'm, I'm just going to close with a, uh, a short poem from André Breton and Philippe uh, Sopo from The Magnetic Fields, uh, translated by uh, Charlotte Mandel, who, of course, as Pierre very well knows, is the wife of Robert Kelly. Um, and so here's that little translation. Grand luxe. Trees are stuffed with luxury hotels. Prisoners reprieved for good behavior. Solid state gaseous liquid, radiant action of the sun, crank operating on the steam of meadows in the mornings. We have to keep track of the admirable distance. I'm the one taking the first steps. If only my friends hadn't been changed into salt statues, 
space of a minute that I traveled through on horseback, imminent vacations, porches in the desert, oh, those cathedrals that are pyramids of monkeys. I think I'm confusing civilizations which smell of purple, another news item. My God, will we will never be. Ritual of the octopus on a rock crystal. It's the skewer on his torso. Tinfoil, no tinged folios, like tablet and papyrus. Ardent ideology, beautiful calves, trumpet in the square. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for this wonderful, wonderful festival, the Lip Balm Surrealist Poetry International Extravaganza. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, and, well, what can I say? Um, I think that leave, leave, leaves little left to be said, except surrealism lives. And we offer you love, poetry, spirituality, and surrealism for all your lives. Thank you for, for being here with us. Good night. Thank you. Bravo to you guys. Long live the extravaganza. May there be many more. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night, Sir George.